Welcome to our fiqh hour, slightly late than uh, usual, um, but inshallah, possibly, potentially, we are on the verge of Ramadan coming to an end and Shawwal being announced. Obviously, we're getting details from different parts of the world uh, coming in over the phone, uh, but we will keep you aware of that, inshallah, through normal channels. In the meantime, we're just going to pick up some questions that We've already got via the Malkas al al Qadha, whilst our chaps here find their answers. And he strategically placed himself uh, at the front. Smart move. Uh, it only took him uh, nine days uh, to, to work that out. <laughs> so, anyway, let's get this one first. Um, where are we? Okay. So, we'll go back to that, that chapu who was in France. And he had started in France, and France don't have their own independent sighting. Uh, he's come back and he said, I saw your response on YouTube. Unfortunately, I was not online to listen to your response. I believe in the local sighting of the moon and not Saudi. So therefore, because he was in France, he went by the France's position. France don't do local sighting. Well, they do do local sighting, but they don't have any uh, method of announcing it around Marseille. They do uh, local sighting. Uh, but unfortunately, they don't um, they don't have a system whereby it's taken on board, and the ulama just take the khabar from Saudi. So he says. Uh, so obviously, he had to start with his uh, where he was. Now he's uh, he's explained that bit, and then he gave another response later, which is um, here. I had fasted thirty days. So today, obviously, he's back in the UK now. Today becomes his thirtieth uh, fast, possibly. I had fasted thirty days. Can I add one more fasting day tomorrow? If I'm following UK moon sighting, when was this? This was today, I think. Yeah, that was today. So I had fasted 30 days, which would be today. Can I add one more fasting day tomorrow if I'm following UK moon sighting based Eid? As previously told you, I was not in the UK in the beginning of Ramadan. I traveled from France to the UK and France started a Ramadan a day earlier. Now I'm living in the UK. Yeah. So, well, we don't know if tomorrow is not going to be Eid. So you don't add anything tomorrow. So for now, obviously, you will fast 30. Uh, those people who follow Saudi are fasting 30. Those people who've gone by local are obviously on their 29th fast right now. Uh, so we will know tonight whether you need to fast or not. So yes, you would go by uh, the declarations made by the ulama here. So just wait and uh, watch this space as the saying goes. In Sunday's Q&A, it was stated if you have paint brushes made out of pig hair, then washing the paint off the bristle, then the impurities are not passed on. Does that mean that you can use combs and beard brushes made out of boar bristles? Uh, two things here. One is the fact that uh, anything from a swine or pig is considered najis al ain So it will never become pure. Okay, so it, it, the thing itself is impure. So we shouldn't obviously be using it and applying it to our face or to our wearing on our clothes or praying salah with or anything like that. So hence the reason. So it's not as though the najasa is coming off like urine. Obviously will come off as a liquid. Feces will come off. So it's a solid. Uh, this is obviously a permanent it's not even a semi-solid it's absolutely solid solid but one can't take a benefit from something which is medicinal ain something which is impure in its you know existence in in its state hence the reason we don't use those things obviously in certain circumstances if, if whatever reason there is um an issue and this is the only thing that a person can use then there's good judge obviously there's a talk at the moment that um it's strange isn't it that the pig is the uh, nearest animal to the human in the sense of uh, organically in terms of its uh, structure therefore they're looking at transplanting pig hearts into humans and i think one has already been done um I think in the uk wasn't it if i'm not mistaken and um it's a chap who had a transplant before but he failed uh, and then he went back onto medication and uh, now he's been given another one he's been taking medication in order for the body not to refuse it but supposedly this could solve the so-called uh, uh, organ problem in the sense that there's not enough organs for people uh, and I guess if you slightly genetically modify it potentially because you can do what you like to animals people don't care as much then maybe it will not ref it will not um, can I reject. reject it that's what I was looking for so it might not reject it either if you can kind of tune it in with your your kind of DNA sort of structure so you know would we permit that would we not permit that I guess we just have that conversation near the time once it becomes slightly more widespread and the the matter gets raised uh as a as a as an issue so the whole question is if you touch them they won't be no problem it's just you shouldn't use them yeah we shouldn't use them because they're not just lying touching yeah? them won't well no touching it you won't need to wash your hands or anything like that because there's no it's not a which transfers 
Uh, Najasa, which transfers, is going to be semi-solids or liquids. Otherwise, the Najasa itself does not transfer. Um, but for example, any other animal skin uh, is purified by Zabah. So even a, a, a lion or a cheetah, obviously we don't advocate using lion skins and cheetah skins. But if you were to uh, uh, slaughter that, then that skin would become pure. But pig skin doesn't become pure at all. And obviously one can't use a human skin either. So let's get on to the ladies group before we move to uh, the brother on our right. <laughs> Bismillah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Inshallah, you are well. Alhamdulillah. Uh, please answer the following questions. A friend took part in a trip organized and paid for by a charity she worked with at the time. Due, due the flights being delayed, she was told she'd be given a compensation payment of £520. The charity received the payment from the airline early this week. Initially, she asked uh, for the funds to be given to the charity. Now she has changed her mind and would like the funds to be used as her zakat for the same charity. Points to note she did not pay for the trip. The compensation was for the disruption caused to all the travellers, so she has every right to it. The funds have never been in her account under her ownership. Would this be valid? Yeah, so the issue you have here is that um, this was offered to her because she was traveling and it was part of her job working for a charity. So it disrupted her, but it did, didn't disrupt her personally. It's not like she had booked a holiday trip and this it was a, as a, you know, it had a consequence to her. It was a work organized trip. So it obviously had a consequence to the organization, not to her necessarily. So that money she had agreed to take and send across there, if obviously this compensation was to the individual, right, and uh, the charity was happy with her receiving it, then even if she did not take, it, it did not come into account, she was entitled to it. And because she was entitled to it, it can become a money. So there's, there's a lot of clarity that needs to be made here. Um, it does not matter if she did not pay for the trip. Somebody else can pay for my trip. And that means that plane ticket is still mine. So if you generous souls gather together, uh, put 100 quid each, you could buy me a, uh, a ticket to Australia. Barbados, sorry. Right? You know, do I own that ticket? Yes, I do now because you've paid for it. You put it on my name. I'm the owner of it because that was Hadia. So the, we need to understand, A, who's, who, you know, who was the compensation due to? Was the compensation due to her as an individual? Was that agreed with the charity? Or was the compensation due for the person that was required to travel to this uh, um, to this place? Um, it impacted the charity. It didn't necessarily impact her because she'd still have to do a day at work. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity here. Uh, another friend's mum has 10 to 12K worth of gold for her for when she gets married, her future. Okay, so the mother is keeping it for her friend. Does the friend have to pay zakat on this? The friend does not want the gold, nor does she plan to wear it. It is currently kept in the family locker for safekeeping. Her mother isn't allowing her to sell it. Her mother's made it clear the gold is for the friend and has no intention of keeping it or using it for herself. So the ownership of this is still the mother. It's not the woman, the girl, the friend. Okay, the ownership is the mother. So she has got ownership of it. She's saying that, obviously, I'm going to give it to you when you marry. So she is, to the, for now, for the purposes of zakat, the woman is the owner, as in the, the mother of the girl, the mother of the friend is the owner. Therefore, she is the one who has to give zakat. Neither party cannot say, oh, it's hers, and the other party says, oh, no, it's hers, and it falls in dead man's land and no one gives zakat. You can't do that. It has to be owned by somebody. So if nobody owns it, then, you know, we can give the uh, masjid's bank details and they can transfer it to the masjid since nobody wants to take ownership of it. Everybody agreed? agreed? Yeah. It is for the individual and the charity were fine with her taking it and she was entitled to compensation. That's fine. So if it's for the individual and the charity was fine with her taking it, then it's her money. If it becomes her money, then obviously as long as she has taken ownership in a sense, it doesn't have to be a uh, real ownership, like physical ownership. As long as she has ownership of it, which it seems from the description she has ownership, then obviously she can do what she chooses with it. That, I think, covers the uh, Q&A from uh, the Marcus Riftawal Qadha. 
So, my dear uh, brother, I think for a change, since we've always been starting from the right, uh, today, because it's the last one, we're going to start from the left. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I've done this well, I, I probably do, but I can't remember. Anyway, never mind that. Um, well, late comers for Janazah Salah. How do they um, catch up once the final, Imam does the final Salah? If he's done the final Salah. No, no, I, I say, say if he came enough, two degrees are done. Then he would uh, make the two takbirs up at the end before he makes a salam. Okay. After the imam. Does After the imam, because there's that little pause, isn't there? Okay. And do, should he have to recite, recite what he's missed or just takbir? takbir no, he just salam. all he can do is a takbir because uh, he's not going to get a chance to recite anything, is he? All right. he, just, he just literally has two seconds, a second, that's yeah. it. So the imam says salam, he just say Allah, 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 Yeah, and that's it. Because the, 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 it's the four uh, takbirs that are wajib, aren't they? Okay. In the janazah salam. All right. Sir, um, if you if you're praying uh, Tarawi, uh like in Jamaat, and then see you. So you're not praying in Jamaat then? Huh? You're not praying in Jamaat. No, no, you are. Praying. You said you, if you pray Tarawi, like you're in Jamaat. I'm not, not mom, yeah. yeah, when you speak to someone, <laughs> that's a scholar. You have to be very specific because yeah. now I'm going to give you an answer based on somebody who's praying. Right. Like he's praying in Jamaat, not actually right. somebody's praying in Jamaat. You see, yeah. that's why the English language is unique, and we don't need to always be saying like, like, like. <laughs> we actually should actually say what yeah. we're saying. So, so are we praying in Jamaat? You're in Jamaat, and then you break your wudu. Let's say like sixteen for that, and then <laughs> and then you come back, and it's like eighteenth now. So then you and then after that is witter. Yes. Are you able to make up the two that you? you missed? No, you'll join with the Imam in the witter, and then you'll make up after. So you, you can make up well if he's so if he's already in the you know if you catch this 18th or 19th or whatever it is or 19th or 20th then you'll do that but obviously yeah. you know you've missed two yeah. you pray the wither with him and then you'll do the two after okay. sleepy guy no no oh. are we allowed to sit like this with the legs crossed <laughs> 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 that's the one there's not that I've seen anything which would prevent you doing that because if I remember correctly, the Prophet Islam, when he would wait after uh, Fajr Sunnah, would do exactly that and he'd have, he'd have his hands behind his head and he'd have. One foot over the other foot, oh, right? So double check that. But I'm pretty sure. But well, that that's the problem. Yeah, that's what, yeah. It's what, the hands behind your back that's the problem. I think it's a. It can't. It, I, I remember one definitely, <clears throat> but whether it's I, sorry, I remember two definitely. Yeah. Whether the one I can't recall. Okay, but yeah, you cannot place your hands behind your back. That that that, that that's considered oh, sinful. Is it? Oh, I didn't so, know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's the one. Um, it's a, it's a, it's not necessarily a fiki issue. It's not that's not discussed in the fiki books. I think it mainly comes from sort of the hadith, isn't it? I don't remember reading it anyway in any fiki book. Oh, that's why it's my memory is slightly hazy about it. But yeah, it's the it's the placing of the hands behind your back and reclining like that. But that 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 issue is not is not because as I said, and remember that I remember quite well that in the after the sunnah of uh, fajr. Um, the Prophet Islam would, because he wouldn't go into like full sleep, uh, would place one foot all across the other and, and recline and just sort of like shut his eyes. Sometimes he did snore, but obviously um, the Prophet's hearts are always awake. And then, uh, so I read the Quran from my phone. So around the edge, it's there's no text, it's just the whiteness of the page. So the actual mudjan is inside the page. Can I touch the white areas? We had this without discussion uh, I thought you could touch yeah, it without about, the musaf. about the Musaf. Yeah, because it's not, so we had yeah. this conversation. There's one opinion, obviously, that the phone itself doesn't have the same hukum as the uh, Musaf. Um, but then obviously there is the position that it does. And, you know, ihtiyat, and I guess it's best to be in a state of wudu. Then there was, uh, Riyaz Bayi raised that point about the fact that, in you know, even the Musaf, if you look at it, the edges, especially some that have a quite a clean border, so you could arguably hold it in the corner and flick it over. Um, and that's a similar point that's being made there. So, you know, we know, for example, that when it comes to plates and uh, 
uh, posters and things that people have ayats on it. It's not that the whole poster becomes an issue. It's just that bit. So when you're disposing this type of material, then you normally cut that bit out and throw the poster away. Like normally in Ramadan, they used to have the, you know, Allah's name or the Prophet Islam's name or something or whatever. And then people would need to discard them at the end of the month and have a big problem on their hands. So, you know, so arguably that, that these are both fair points. Okay. However, we would still say ihtiyat is, is best to, to avoid. But yeah, I would say that, that, that it's a valid point. Even, even in the physical Muslim, it's a valid point. Young man, Ooh, you're in the big boy circle now. <laughs> Any big boy questions? Small boy questions? Okay. Uh, computers. Is that a genuine question? Are you are you addicted? Do you find yourself waking up at night and getting withdrawal symptoms and rushing downstairs? And then putting it on and then uh, you get a little bit of <laughs> First thing in the morning. Is it, can you miss it? Is it a particular game? Is it a particular game that you miss? You don't understand my accent, no? Is it a particular game that you miss? Oh, no. Translate for me. Yeah, no, translate for me. Is there a game that you like the most? Yeah. What game is it? What game? Yeah. 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 What's it called? Fortnite, Fortnite. 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 Every two weeks. It's a game for Fortnite. So if you're playing every two weeks, what's the problem? <laughs> why why get up every morning and play it? Um, yeah, games are obviously addictive. Games are made addictive. That's the whole point. And I think if I'm not wrong, Fortnite is 18 plus. No, no. No? Oh, so how do you know? As a what? Oh, so, so to, in order to give an, uh, an educated, in order to give an educated opinion. <laughs> MashaAllah, bless you. So what is it? What's the age on it? 12 to 20. 12 to 20. 12 to 20. 12 to 20. 12 to shooting in it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it killing in it? Yeah. 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 Oh, so you don't shoot people? No, you do. You do. And you kill them? Yeah. Yeah. Your aim is to kill people? This is kind of like the whole, the whole Look, game. Look, you've got this kind of light thing going on. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 there's no blood. There's no blood. It's not like yeah. OMG. So there's no blood? No. Yeah. It's just... It's yeah, not like when, you, when you shoot someone, they kind of just like... You just shoot them and then they're dying. Yeah. They just disappear. So they eliminate like... They just, oh. <laughs> it's not like... And you, you like sort of going down and killing people then? In the first thing in the morning? <laughs> is that what it is? Is that the excitement? Do you want to beat your score? Or is it yeah, some friend? You want to beat your own score? Yeah. Or you don't play with like friends that, you know, friends. Can you do this like where you do it joint, oh, yeah. collaborative? Oh, friends, yeah. You don't play with friends, you just play with your own and you just like beating that score. I kind of just started again. Sorry? I just started again. And now I can't understand your accent. I'm not that one. Man. <laughs> yeah so you know the thing is it's hard to kind of like dissuade something i know you know you look how old are you 11 12 11 so you can't even play fortnite now what's the ring what the heck man soon as give me like two years old well, I, I'm just winding him up because I know most people don't really look at these age restrictions. How old are they really? Go on, check Fortnite. It's, it'll be on your Amazon wish list. Is it free game? Is it free? You don't buy it. Yeah. Oh. So how do you get a free game nowadays? Or just download it? Yeah. Page 12. Ah, you go. Page 12. So you got wait like a year. Parental intervention. Sorry? A oh, one month. Yeah, no, don't tell him that. Though. Don't make the lead for him. <laughs> don't make the lead for him. G. No, 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 no. Just because everyone's time is everyone's time is of value. It's been that. We'll come around anyway. Okay, is it like got Hansel and Gretel in it? <laughs> You know what you've done by doing that? You just build it up, haven't you? By yeah. saying those few points like, oh, it's too long, there's a backstory, whatever. Now everyone's going to think like, okay, and then if you don't deliver, <laughs> now it's going to be like, so isn't it? It's going to be disappointing, isn't it? Never build a, never build a question. Um, the thing, question regarding um, LGBT, and I just wanted to know whether you think being gay is a choice. Yeah. 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 Um, so based on just saying of a person who grew up in a very practicing Muslim household, 
had no TV in the house, but a Muslim school to Muslim school, couldn't have a smartphone until quite late, so it's quite sheltered. His sister was an alima, he went to Bleak Jama, often with his dad, he was as soon as much as he could, but the translation of the Quran, and yet he has no feelings towards women, he has feelings towards men. Um, quite specific because that's new. Um, I didn't think much of it in the beginning, but around 17, 18, I started realizing I was different. I spent many nights crying for love, feeling lost and conflicted, wondering why I had no attraction towards women. I felt so alone, and I only had a lot of time to sleep. It began to get physically and mentally draining, and in 2020, I decided to tell my family that keeping in was too much, and I knew they'd start talking about getting married. But what marriage would last on false attractions and deceit, it wouldn't be fair for the woman or for me. Telling them literally lifted away from my shoulders. My mom did say some hurtful things, and she said we need to contact a mufti, and he says if you need to leave the house, then you have to go. Um, I, I, I'm not listening to the email the mufti, but he didn't reply, so my mom called him. And to our surprise, he said, I agree with your son, it's not a choice. He's going to be going through a lot, so you need to tell him that you accept him, I will support him. And Mufti was Mufti Mugera. I was extremely grateful for his words and him and confirm what I already knew. Every of my family's views completely changed. He said he's had people calling him saying the same thing. He said it's not my fault from Allah, we don't know why. Allah creates everybody differently, but we can't act on it because of the story of the Ta'ala. There were here yeah, there were a lot of silent moments. He understood how hard it was for me to know what else he could say. He said I should try and do something productive, which makes me feel accomplished. Um, I decided to make a YouTube video talking about my experience for two reasons. One, to help other Muslims who are in the same situation, feeling lost and confused. And most importantly, because of how valuable Iman is, to help the ones who feel that due to this conflict, they have to leave Islam. And two, to highlight what the movie said, that being gay isn't a choice, because there are still so many people who think it is. I got lots of comments saying that, oh, you've got Jahannam, you're possessed by jinn, and in um, the same way a person chooses not to still, you can choose your attraction. But why would someone choose to be discriminated against and choose to be gay, especially living in a country where it's illegal? Um, through the YouTube video and social media, I made quite a few connections with friends, people who are Muslim and gay all over the world, in Kuwait, Morocco, Algeria, Lebanon, Nigeria, UAE, India, Pakistan, Palestine. Um, we support each other and they are for advice. I say that it helps a lot, as mentioned the that it brings a heart to them. Um, I, can't, I don't think it can be said that you are influenced to the day, as we've all had very different childhoods and life experiences. I think because a lot of Muslims wrongfully believe that it's a choice, they think that schools could change their child's minds and turn them gay. But sexuality isn't a choice, and as someone who works in a school, nothing explicit is cool. It's age appropriate, and it just lets them know that in life we've come across different people and we treat them with respect. I think it's needed, especially in a time where even, even Western countries, homophobic attacks happen. Recently, a teenager in the UK and US were both beaten to death by their peers from around 15, 16 years old. Educating others that Allah has created people with different attractions could literally prevent someone from losing their life. We don't call children out of our lessons, saying that learning about Christianity or Hinduism might make them leave Islam and go to that religion. We let them learn about it so that they're respectful to people who are different to them. Maybe if I had a lesson when I was at school, I wouldn't have spent so many years feeling confused and alone with dark thoughts. I thank Allah and Allah for giving me the strength and keeping me such fast. Some say this is a test for life, but I believe Islam is a way of life for everybody. And like you mentioned recently, Islam understands understand have his highest and doesn't expect us to say, stay celibate, which is why halal has been given, marriage. And it happens me and others are told you have to stay celibate and alone the rest of your life. I do not this is realistic. And because of the meeting, do I'm specifically saying what is in your ilma, as I feel there are answers out there, they just haven't been found or even glossed over. I see Allah choosing me to come for it, pick up from being in your presence, that I've made the part of my God and accepted. I understand it's something you may need to go back and think about or discuss. Yeah. And the question was? <laughs> <laughs> I need a question. There was a backdrop story, mashallah. What was the question? What's the or the specific questions or the key the key the key points that you wanna you want me to address? I I I was, the first thing to understand about sexuality is usually it's you know there's one element of exposure and there's one el and there's an element. There's this old whole nurture nature argument that we have about all things, not just about sexuality, about the way we are as people. You know, for example, if you go from a, an inner city area, uh, Yanni, you either be quite an aggressive fella or you be a very sort of secluded fella. So one is that 
because of the inner city, it's, it's, it's in your face. There's violence. Uh, you're exposed to violence. You've got to quickly get into a gang in order to survive. Uh, you know, so you have that element. But then you have another element, depending on a person's fitrat, where he will prefer to kind of step away from that scene completely. And he would be more homeward bound uh, and, and, and not engage. So the whole point I'm making about that is that your the nurture of a person, uh, meaning the way he's been exposed to certain things and his fitrat will both tie in together. So it's not just a completely isolated that, oh, had you not been exposed to ABC, you want to turn out like this. And it's not the other way completely that, or it's got, you know, the, the, the nature of the person isn't. So yeah, bilkul, Allah SWT creates people differently. We have no doubt about that whatsoever. That is in the way he creates and that is what his his mannerism is. Why he does that, we have people obviously that are created in some way, you know, physically different, mentally different. Uh, and these are this is his creation and we accept that. Obviously, we also know that a person can have, uh, uh, you know, mixed gender. Uh, we might say, well, what's the point in creating someone like that for? You know, why would a why would Allah create a khuntha? You know, who is the khuntha supposed to get married to, to 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 a man or or to a woman? So this is his creation, and he has his plan and he has his will. And then there's also obviously how we react to our surroundings. So some people will react, like I said to you, I gave you the kind of street kind of uh, background that we we react differently as well. So I cannot say for each any individual what it is exactly that's. The, the root cause of that that person to me the easy answer would be it's a mixture of the two where along that spectrum is it more this way more that way Allah Allah. that's something that uh is difficult to to say unless you can really go back and follow the person's life and uh, what they've gone through and, and as a child and uh, as they move on in terms of what is the hukum of this thing well obviously I think what Mufti Magaris have said is, is is spot on the hukum of the thing is this is that the Sharia has not legitimized it to fulfill that physical relationship like the way for example you know i might be um uh, attracted to um a woman that i meet uh, outside and she's a non-muslim she doesn't want to convert and i'm physically attracted to her now can i meet my uh, sexual satisfactions with her no i can't uh, that might be uh, difficult for me to accept because that means that i will feel as though i'm not sexually fulfilled or sexually satisfied because i can't be with that particular woman but I know that this whole life is a test uh, and my full, true gratification uh, of sexual nature is not going to happen to the Akhir anyway. The other thing is, obviously, we said, you know, that, uh, you know, I think in one of the lectures, if you remember, we talked about uh, marriage and how we sometimes have this uh, uh, misconstrued uh, and slightly glamorous uh, view of marriage that it's going to be very romantic. We're going to hold hands, you know, the old petals on the toilet lid and all the rest of it, uh, that it's going to be like that. And it doesn't turn out like that. Sometimes people have intimacy half a dozen times and that's it. And there's a lot, you know, I've spoke to two chaps just in this masjid alone that feel that they're sexually frustrated. Okay. Because they don't feel that the wife is on the same kind of uh, plane as they are on. Um, you know, one particular chap's wife slightly suffers uh, with a little bit of ADHD. So her mindset is is, is very different to what, what he... So so he's now sort of saying, you know, what should I do? Um, so, you know, we explore the second marriage sort of thing, whatever, and he says, look, I've been there, and it didn't work out, basically. I used to kind of go behind the scenes and not tell my first wife about it. Eventually, she clocked on, uh, and then life became very difficult for me, and then he had to leave that, leave the second wife. So these are what we call, you know, um, sort of... I, I, I use the word sexual frustrations in the sense that we don't feel fully gratified sexually that there is some kamai, there's some there's some kind of um, reduction or uh, not a fulfillment of it. Similarly, now, obviously, marriage takes place very late. You know, we've got young lads here in their 20s. Probably none of them are married. Now, obviously, Bulu comes to us at 13, 14. Now, without necessarily being explicit and asking people to dig deep into their childhoods, we know the challenges that we face when we go through that, specifically when we're in uh, um, schools, where the mixed gender schools, and uh, we're exposed to that kind of thought. So this one of a desire for something which Allah has made impermissible, one feeling not fully sort of, uh, sort of sexually gratified, these are issues that a person will face irrespective of which direction, how they go about in life. One, one, one thing one thing a person can't say to themselves that I'm being punished for something. Okay, that's one thing one can't put on themselves that I'm being punished for something, that this is something that 
is is you know that I need to deal with whatever. When we come to this issue about uh, sort of blame or or, or you know, you know do, you, do you put some blame on yourself or whatever? Thinking like I said, we the, the Sharia will put this as a sin to carry out that act. It would consider it as a sin, like it would be to carry out any other act that I just spoke about. It would be a sin. One cannot say that you know because this is the way it is. It's not considered as a sin. It would be. And one has to accept that and therefore stay away from those boundaries. Now, it is a challenge. You know, some of those conversations I've given now is that, well, okay, in a situation where a person is um, young, they know that, you know, marriage will happen sooner or later. So there's a there's a hope, shall we say, or, or, a, or a vision that those aims will be fulfilled as well. But the chap who's married, but, you know, is not, is not, fully satisfied with his wife for whatever reason then he might still have access to physical interactions with a with a woman but again that could be limited as well let's let's say but when somebody who's feels like that uh towards the same gender and the sharia is forbidding it then that's something which that person has to come to terms with that this is something i will never be able to fulfill this is something that i, I cannot fulfill because the sharia forbids me to do it whereas he permits me through this route he permits me through this route he won't permit me through this route so once that person sort of accepts those terms, then it's a case of trying to kind of, you know, it's, it's, as I said, it's very easy from our perspectives to give this kind of advice because we don't walk in the shoes that people walk in. Like when we give advice to sisters, we, I always try to put a little disclaimer as best as I can understand it, as best as we can, because at the end of the day, we don't walk in their shoes. We don't know what each person is going through. So all we can do is speak from a, from a slight distance in doing that. So once a person realizes whatever you know, desires they are, exist. And once the person, and you've got to kind of go through it in a logical sense and accept that these are something that I cannot fulfill. Uh, many women, for example, stay patient with husbands that, you know, abuse them or mistreat them or don't treat them like wives. And they always say that I'm going to do sabr and I'm going to get a, a better husband in the akhirat or I'm not going to disrupt my children's lives because by doing this, it's going to affect my children's lives because they're not going to have a, uh, a, a, a complete family, a mom, dad, and, and and children. So we all make those kind of collective choices. We all make those kind of decisions. So that would be something that I would be suggesting if anybody came to me would be to kind of move along that process, to stay in that process, to kind of stay in that mindset uh, is going to be very challenging. Let's be frank, for the next 30, 40, 50 years of a person's life, it's going to be very challenging. So how are they going to move along from this? How are they going to accept this kind of uh, norm and accept this that, okay, I've come to terms with this now. Maybe there was a denial. Maybe there was this. Maybe there was that, whatever. But I've come to terms that, you know, this is this is what I think I am or this is what, how I think or this is how I feel. Now, how am I going to move forward with this? You know, if I'm only in my mid-20s, I've got another potential 50 years to live. Now, living in a sort of a frustrated way, for all that time can be challenging. So it's a case of saying yes and moving on. And like we said, full, full, full satisfaction is not necessarily there for everybody, even, you know, a husband and wife relationship. Uh, sometimes, especially, you know, it depends, but some women that come from uh, uh, foreign countries will feel that once you reach past the age of 35, husband and wives are or past 40, husband and wife shouldn't be doing that kind of stuff anymore. You know, it's just not, it's not appropriate because each culture has a way where there's a chap, you know, and similarly, you know, without being too crude, men growing up in the, in the UK want to do certain type of things with their wife, which a woman from another country will think, you know, that's not what I got taught. You know, the only thing you're going to do is, you know, the, uh, the standard position and, and jobs are good. And, you know, and that's, you know, you, off you go. You've had your three minutes of fun and, you know, hustles around the corner. So what I'm saying is, is that, there is not everybody is going to get that full sexual satisfaction. I don't think anybody really does. <laughs> yeah, not, not everybody. <laughs> Similarly, what happens as well, you see, is that, you know, men, again, it's, you know, apologies for young, you know, for, but men, for example, you know, they just get their one minute, two minutes of fun and that's it. But as we know, uh, that for a woman, it takes a lot longer to get things moving and then it takes a lot longer to get a satisfied book. The man might think, I, I couldn't really give a, a hoot about that because I'm just in it for myself. And jobs are good and I'm done. So there's also going to be that lack of full satisfaction for that woman. 
So, you know, what does she do now for the man? Obviously, he's got a choice. He can marry us, you know, if his wife is frigid or, or whatever, she's got issues. He can then decide, I'm going to marry a second wife or a third wife or a fourth. What does she do? Uh, then, obviously, you go, uh, you know, ED. Uh, and you've got other issues that, you know, men can face that cannot fully satisfy a woman. Um, so, once we come to terms with that, of, what, you know, how we are, and we accept that, the second thing we come to terms with is the realization that, you know, that may never happen. This whole level of achieving exactly what may never happen. And then it's a case of saying, right, how do I move forward with that now? What's the next best thing? What else can I do, you know, and, and, and do that? Because at the end of the day, humans need food, humans need water, humans need sleep, and humans need that satisfaction. It's just, this, we cannot deny that. They need that. It's a, it's a need. As soon as a person becomes an adult, it's a need. Why do you think we refrain from it in, in Ramadan? Why do you think in the Kafir man can't even engage with his wife by text in, you know, in, that, in that kind of way, uh, uh, you know, of, of kind of sexual talk? For that reason, he's got to kind of keep his mind and switch away from it. So there has to be a realization that you can't stay in this kind of thought bubble because it, that's not going to solve the solution. And that's not saying, oh, aren't we then denying what that person is are we kind of just brushing it under the carpet are we sort of saying you know sort it out or whatever no it's not it's the fact that that thought bubble doesn't resolve this person's physical needs it doesn't resolve that and also what it does is that it traps this person into this kind of mindset uh and and it doesn't it, it's not progressive so i don't know if i answered all the questions that you asked me but i tried my best to kind of uh work around that um, do you know the verse from the Quran about plural woman doesn't have to um, cover in front of? Do you know towards the ending there's one that um, men without sexual desire and then some translate that to saying always an elderly man or a unit, for example? Yes. How? And I saw the um, commentary on it. Of Ibn Hajar Maki he said it doesn't mean an old man because old men can still have desires and the eunuch, regardless of whether they have the genitals or not, they can still have desires. So then, could you suggest that that would I fall under that? The, the, if you're saying that that person then can come in front of women that aren't um, his mahram because they f fear. They don't fear from him because he doesn't engage with them in that way. It's difficult to say because how would a person, how would a person? So I've seen that verse and now that often and there's that, um, hadith, I think the Aisha of Tunis and the Aisha of Hatta, or somewhere they had it. The hadith says, Mukanda, yes, which is all for fake. That's and right. He was allowed to be with the wives. With That's the right. Child. But as soon as he made that comment he where he described the woman's the features, and it wasn't necessarily in a sexual way where he describes a woman's features because he just talks about the folds of fat, which, you know, it's not really a, a turn on for blokes. Well, you know, I guess it depends what you, what it is, but he just describes it in that way. And immediately the person would say, don't let this person uh, sit amongst you. You find in Pakistan in particular, it probably exists in another place where you get very effeminate men. OK, you know, where they, yeah, where they, you know, do all the dancing, they'll dress up fully like women. Uh, they'll put lipstick on, you know, so you get like also, is it uh, Bangkok as well, where you get, you know, boy, men, lady boys. OK, so in certain cultures, you get that where men will, you know, it's also in the prison system uh, where you'll get men who will gladly, you know, adopt that kind of behavior and attire. Now, are they inclined towards that and, and then they just wear that? So it, you see in cultures and, and not so much in other cultures. So even in, in, in so Western cultures, you don't see that mass. Uh, it's happening more now, but it never used to happen in Pakistan. It was like normal, you know, yeah. where even 50, 60 years ago, it'd be normal and everybody would bat an eyelid when they would come normally to weddings to dance, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. You would actually hire them and, 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 and they would come over, whatever. So it's, it, in a way, it was normalized, whatever. So... You know, it's, as I said, it's hard to say how a person can feel, you know, can say, it, a, a woman can say that I feel comfortable from this chat because I, I don't feel. I because a Nepali friend. Yeah. She, um, she, what she posted on Instagram, she, she's, she has, she's adding on to her closeness that she posted on. Mm. I haven't told her to do that. Mm. Yeah. Her. 
Now, I, you know, I would still avoid those circumstances and those situations because, you know, as you, because the thing is, many people might might sort of feel that they might be inclined towards uh, one gender, but then they find that actually, you know, I might be sort of bisexual. You know, I'm actually, I, I'm not as attracted to women. I'm more attracted to men, but you know, it still excites me that talk of that. Uh, similarly, like a man could be attracted to a woman, uh, but then he might have a slight sort of fascination. Uh, and you know, uh, there's a lot of you know accessibility now to porn, uh, and when people are watching porn and whatever, it just it does make people think differently, and it, the whole concept of uh, you know sexualization changes uh, in a, in a big way um, because of that. And as I said, it's so readily available now. So therefore, there, there will be issues with regards to that as well. So it's, it's, it's not, it, one cannot say distinctly, you know, I'm in this camp, so to speak, or I'm in this camp, or that's it, you know, um, depending on, I guess, you know, I won't say opportunity, but depending on circumstances, a person might be slightly inclined this way or this. So I, I, would, I would behave as, as a man would behave. So if any Bhair Mahram is, showing anything of her features or anything, then you would, you would say, look, you know, you need to remove me from this inner circle because obviously you're sharing, um, you know, not intimate pictures, but you're sharing uh, pictures as though you would share with sisters and obviously I'm a bloke. I just add an opinion to that, Sheikh. Yeah. You know what you said is gender is male and female. We That's know right. That, it? So we're supposed to be part of the other gender. That's regardless correct. of That's our correct. feelings. That's there's correct. some ugly women that might, look ugly and you look at them and you will never think twice about it, doing anything it. with them but you still have to do part that with them that's correct yeah yeah no no so that's, that's actually yeah, that's, a, that's a good that's a good point uh, no but i think he's referring to that particular verse which in the verse it mentions that you can remove your garments in front of men like that or children who cannot differentiate between uh women yani that like you know when you were a kid yeah. uh you know we used to you know and they used to in school they used to say yeah, like yeah in, in, you know if, in, in school they used to say to you right we're going to have boys and girls sitting next to each other. What was the first thing you did? <laughs> you know, like, that was the first thing you did. Uh, because, and also, you know, you, if, you know, you, you wouldn't even know when your mum was bearing child because it just it just didn't click on you, those sorts of things. It's only when you start getting older, you start sort of understanding things a little bit different. And and, and uh, so so that, that's, that's, the, that's the one he's referring to. However, in, in these, uh, we would always act, act in that way. Um, that um, you see what you, you know in front of servants, servants weren't considered as like sort of fully human in, in a way, in the sense so that they would talk in front of them and dress in a certain way because the servants would go in and out of houses and rooms. Now, every time if you do part of that, you know, you're gonna have a problem. So, therefore, they were a little bit relaxed about it. But as soon as they saw, like, you know, he was standing or looking, then they realized that, okay, he's, he's not minding his own business. When he's coming in, instead of just having his head down and cleaning up or doing what he needs to do and leaving the room, he's actually looking and, you know, oh, you've got some nice shoes on and you've got some nice... And when you make comments like that, then that's the way that's... Give, that's giving some indication that, you know, there's a, there seems to be an interest uh, that, that has to be there. So I wouldn't start changing ahkam. Yeah, I think we'd say, like, I lower my gaze from women and from men as well. Okay. And... Um, so I have obviously working as well. I have a lot of female colleagues, so that's they've become like my friends, and I feel like I'm better with them. It'd be more of a fit, more fit enough for me to hang out with guy friends. Um, so I've got one colleague; she doesn't really play something. I went to her house, and then it was kind of for So then I was like, oh, she she'd be more happy to play with somebody. So then I, I said to my sister, because you know, there's happy faces that if you're with, if it's just you and a non muslim woman, you shouldn't play. That's yourself. right. But if there's two. Then you can because yeah. it's less likely the child yeah. something happening. Now that's my yeah. sister. Well, there's not any chance of anything happening with me with just her. So but the thing is, what you have to be wary of is the ahkam. Not necessarily change the ahkam because of how you feel. That that's gonna, that becomes dangerous, you see, because I might feel, you know, there's a, or, you know, I won't use this on myself, but some brother might feel who's 55 years old that I find with a 17 year old, 18 year old, you know, she's like younger than my daughter, you know, a book, you know, shaitan can, can do, you know, so the, the, the rules of Barda and Hurma would still apply, irrespective of how you feel, um, you know, because th th that, that's, that's boundaries which have been set. Uh, and they're not open to sort of negotiations. Now, if you feel that I don't feel comfortable with male friends, um, because you know, but I, I can't, you know, I, I, obviously I don't know your personal circumstances, but you know, if uh, if I'm if there's somebody around me that's female, 
uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily be attracted to, if that makes sense. You know, I have control of my thing that, that as soon as I see a woman, I don't think, oh, you know. <laughs> Do you get what I mean? I will talk to her, whatever. Mufti I've got a question. Let's just say someone walks up to you on the street. So I almost have got a question. I won't be looking at the, what does she look like, what does she, she look like, or whatever. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't want to pry too too much into your personal thing. That, you know, it's not that every bloke you see that you kind of feel attracted to, um, because that's just not normal. Um, it's not that every woman a man sees is always going to be attracted to, because then in a way, there seems to be a slightly higher sexualization uh, of your interaction with humans, which is not 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 normal, basically from from my experience. And obviously, I don't know. You know, we can get some experiences and. With the shaking is that there so it's yeah so it's not it's not a normal kind of thing so you know we work with uh you know i'm sure he works with women i don't work with women but he works with women uh you know in, in, in hospitals, yeah he works that's why i assume yeah. that i assume that yeah because hospitals have a lot of nurses and stuff oh yeah so you know you know what i mean so he's gonna engage so for him to you know and for him to always look for him to always look at her in that way i would be very very surprised um and you know you know, if I push you, said to him, sorry for making it on you, but if I push you, said to him that, oh, you know, do you find anybody attractive? He's probably going to say no. And then really, really I push, he'd say, yeah, well, you know, okay, maybe she looks okay. And that's it, you know, but he wouldn't be sort of like, you know, the way you just mentioned there that I would feel uncomfortable with male friends because I'd be attracted to them. That just sort of makes me think, you know, it's a bit. Yeah, I don't mean. Just yeah, do you get what I mean? It just sounded I mean, it. I yeah, you get what I mean? It's like every man you see, you think. I feel women are generally more. Um, accepting if I just tell them I'll get one even like that. So but but why would you need to tell anyone that? Because let's just say I've got a ravenous appetite. I might, you know, let's just say I've got a ravenous appetite. I won't disclose my my sexual situation with anybody. Oh, Did you hear what I mean? I, I wouldn't. But so and women do like listening to that sort of thing. So they, and they like men who are sensitive. Trust me, you know, they, they like sensitive men. So it, it could be that you've got a listening ear uh in that kind of company and therefore that's why you'll kind of feel attracted to them and in the sense of they listen and men are men can be very uncouth and very you know blokey blokey yeah you know banter and this and that and, and you kind of feel i don't actually feel comfortable here in this kind of setting it feels a little bit too macho macho and i feel a little bit better here sensitive. that's just a person's sensitivities and what it shouldn't happen then is that a person's sensitivities then impacts him on the way he sees other things as well. So you might want to unpack that a little bit as well in, in, in your mind. Uh, but really, the, you know, the Sharia is there. It's clear to have these kind of intimate conversations with women in privacy, in their houses, is, you know, is, is, is past the you know, line of hurma, isn't it? It's Because it's, it's, they're going to feel more comfortable at times. Uh, you know, women, emotion can get sometimes better of them. Then they're going to want to you know, hug you when they're a bit upset. Uh, then you're putting yourself in these sort of circumstances. Now you might say, well, you know, I don't feel anything and I can zone that out. Uh, maybe, but there might be a little 10%, a 15% where some Khaish goes through the warmth of the body uh, because that doesn't have to be any gender, does it? Um, and, you know, it's so these are boundaries that we're not supposed to transgress. So uh, I would unpack this kind of sensitivity nature of you. You know, you might be a very sensitive chap um, and therefore... Uh, the, that company makes it makes it a little bit better for you. So it's not just because I think you're homing in on that, you know, like that you you know you you you, you mentioned there that you'd actually tell a person that, that that's that well, that's what you are. Uh, but I would say Ooh, why, you know, I won't I won't sp speak about my intimate things. You know, what would be the reason for disclosure? Is that to get feet make her feel safe? Why would you disclose that to a woman so that she feels safe that she don't think oh okay he's all right I can. I can relax in front of him. I didn't mean like I explicitly say, but then I feel like just like, like you said, like in my nature, I feel like I'm not like masculine, masculine. So then, question if I can not I just literally ask him to get, like, yeah, I'd be more confident with him. Yeah, you know, yeah, but that's what I mean. It's I a, just come and be like, I'm well, it's like if someone says, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it's like if a woman, you know, why would a woman even ask me, say, or any of these guys what they're kind of, you know, get up at home in the bedrooms you know they get what i mean because that's what this is because when we say about that you know kind of man chill with a man like we've all chilled together as blokes right we've had a good laugh we've talked whatever so when we say the word gay what we're referring to here specifically is physical intimacy aren't we that's what we're speaking about yeah so we wouldn't discuss that i wouldn't discuss that with anybody you know i like you guys mashallah very well but i'm going to tell you you know 
what, what you know what, what I get up to, what I don't get up to because I just you know I, we're not on those kind of terms. No, what I mean is that you know it's just not something I would disclose. I wouldn't even be able to disclose that with my brother, who I've known since he was since when he was born. So it's just that maybe you 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 want that listening ear, uh, you get that listening ear. Um, you're a sensitive person, clearly. Uh, women can, uh, without doubt, are the more sensitive of us in the two genders. Um, they're then just, you know, because Michelle, the conversation go anywhere, you know, uh, and then it goes there, and then you kind of feel that you have to identify with this. Now, if you've not acted upon that particular uh, urge, then how can you even describe yourself by using those words? No, but I mean, but until you've, you know, you get what I mean? I, I, Attraction isn't just the act of practice. But it might just be friend. It might just be you look up to a certain type of men. You know, we all like role models. Attraction is different to, to the act of role models. Yeah. It's not the fact that it's called attraction. Yeah, but it's not the fact that it's called attraction. That's what he's trying to say, isn't it? Yeah, but. Yeah, so that's what I mean. So we just, that's, so we, it's that point again, isn't it? It's going back to the sexual part. This is what I'm saying. So, you know, I could look at Rahim and I think, Alhamdulillah, you know, what a bloke, strong, you know, speaks his mind. I look, I, you know, I like that character in him. But, you know, will it go further than that? Of course not. But so that's, that's the key bit I'm saying is that it seems to be that when you're looking at people or, engaging with people that it might be that that's always the undercurrent so when you spoke about women you said you know i don't feel sexually attracted to them therefore i can feel comfortable around them with blokes i feel a little bit so it's always that phrase that's coming in you know the the, the sexual phrase that's coming in so it might be that there's something that you've got to work around that unpack that a little bit because you know we can all be blokes and have a good blokey sort of thing and i can have a lot of respect for these guys which i do have a lot of respect for these guys but that's about it you know it's going to be the good blokes as someone i can hang out with someone i can go out for dinner with have a laugh with whatever but it stops there. There's only one person, alhamdulillah, that I want to be in that way with, and that's my wife. So, you know, it's, it's, it's this, maybe you need to kind of explore the different type of relationships that can exist, which are neutral, uh, and, and don't necessarily have to be of that, of that fitra, of that nature. So there's, there's a kind of unpacking that you need to kind of explore there's, as well. There's, there's a, there's, I'm sorry to butt in. Yeah. Um, there, there is a Muslim charity that I came across maybe about a year ago, um, for people who have inclinations of homosexuality um, and they give a lot of support and stuff. Um, I, ca I can't think of the, the charity's name on top of my head right now, but um, I came across them. Um, I, if, if you want, then ask me for the details. But I think that there's, there's a lot that, you know, uh, you need to sort of unpack. There's like three or four things that I've just noticed as well. Um, you know, uh, you feel that like you need to be label yourself um, whereas I don't feel there's a need for you to label yourself. Um, why you have to label yourself, I, I don't I don't get that. Because like when, there's, when I've had all of this of like confusion of like, what am I kind of thing, then yeah. giving myself a label, saying like, okay, now I can, this is why I like. No, but you're you. Yeah, exactly, and that's part of no, but, but why do you need to describe yourself through a sexual way? You are you. No, just being gay doesn't mean, it's not just like actual sex, it's just like, but it is. Your attraction. Like yeah. you said, of a, of a, you wouldn't do anything more to them yes, because then that means you're heterosexual. That's right. I'm not like that. Yeah, so that's my point. So it moves towards sexual. This is this, this is why we keep going to the same phrase. It keeps going to sexual, doesn't it? This is my point. So but you feel that you have to describe yourself based on your sexuality. Why do you need to I don't describe myself as heterosexual. I describe myself as a mufti. Because so, no, but no, I'm on about me. Forget what people assume me for. Yeah, I don't care what these brothers think of me. <laughs> you know, they can think of me what they like. What I'm saying is, is that I don't describe myself through my sexuality. I describe myself as a mufti. I describe myself as a bloke. I describe myself as a, a Bradfordian. You know, I'll use so many, you know, a Patan, uh, somebody who's got uh, Pakistani. You know, I could have so many levels before someone said, oh, yeah, you know. Uh, like, you know, and that would be like a kind of like a, you know, not a biggie. I wouldn't even use that. But for you, it seems to be the core. That's my point I'm making to you. It seems to be the core for you. Because of the way this country is pushing it to be yeah, outspoken. Like, yeah, to be outspoken. Just, yeah. Yes, uh, in a way, I get it, that you feel like you need to be outspoken about it. But really, everybody has... Look, you don't know what happens in different people's minds and different people's lives, what people have been through. Yeah. Now, people, some 
people might be attracted to children. Yes. Do you get what I mean? Like little girls, they might see a 12 year old girl and think, oh, she's all right. Do you get what I mean? And they might have thoughts. Allah! That doesn't make them feel like they're doing Having the thought or attraction yeah. to the opposite, to the same gender or, Allah, or animal. Allah! Yeah. Allah! That's just Allah. Shukar, Allah. Maybe it's in no, 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 if, like if, if, if that child, Allah, if that child Allah, describes Allah. himself like that feeling, and not about oh, all these other things, then there's something wrong, like, is it? Or this this made-up guy that you mentioned that likes this 12-year-old, 11-year-old girl. If that's the only way he describes himself with, and that's the way he wants to be labelled, and he doesn't want to be labelled by all these other things that he is, then that shows there's some issue there, isn't there? That's the point I'm making. Is there's there an issue there? Is there? And be part of something that it doesn't matter. So you're Muslim, for instance. Our life is what's No, it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean, yeah, it could be, it could be, or you might change it, or you don't know. But at the end of the day, we are Muslims first. Before we're anything, 